you guys are good. Everybody good? Yeah. All right, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 12. So if you would turn in your Bibles, we will look at Exodus chapter 12. Actually, let's do 11. That's, no, 12. No, the, uh, now, I'll do a little bit of 11, then we'll jump down to 12. I'm going to read the first four verses, or three verses of 11, and then I'm going to read 12. It's going to be kind of long. Whew. So if you find that, if you can, if you're able, stand to your feet. Jason's over there looking. Am I going to fall over? I just feel dizzy today. I'm a dizzy dude. All right. Exodus chapter 11 talks about the plague of the firstborn, and then the next one will be the death angel. We're going to briefly touch on the plagues today, if I can just kind of talk just a moment about each of them. Um, but I want us to see something in 12. So as I read 12, I just want you to think about what I'm reading, okay? But in verse 1 of chapter 11 it says this now the lord has said to moses i will bring one more plague on pharaoh and on egypt after that he will let you go from here and when he does he will drive you out completely tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbor for articles of silver and gold the Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So go ask the people for silver and gold, because you are leaving. Chapter 12 says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The lamb you choose must be a year-old male without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left over in morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your house. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it, from the first day through the seventh day, must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred, a sacred assembly, and another on the seventh day. Do not work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. This is all you may do, or that is all you may do. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because it was on this, this, this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses, and whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off 
from the community of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native born. Eat nothing made with yeast wherever you live. You must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animal for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood, into the basin, and put some on the, of the blood on the top and on the both sides of the door frames. Not one of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land and strikes down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frames and will pass over the doorway and will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does the ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoners, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead." During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said, and go, and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said, We will all die. So they took their dough from the yeast before the yeast was added, and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Many other people went up with them as well as large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds, with the dough they had brought from Egypt. They baked cakes of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Now the length of time the Israelites or this is like people lived in Egypt, was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt. On this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for the generations to come. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for being a God of your word a God of your promises, a God who promises, protects, and has a plan for your people. And Lord, today I just pray that we would hear you clearly, that you are the Lord, the one and only true God. Apart from you, there is no other. Lord, we are to worship you in spirit and truth, for without you, we can do nothing. Father, we love you. We thank you for the life that you have given us through the Passover lamb, your son, Jesus. Father, thank you for the provisions that you put in place for us to know you, to be cleansed by you, forgiven, and dearly loved. Father, we look forward to the day we will see you in heaven. May we honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. Wow, I thought I was going to pass out reading all that. So God has kept his promise. And I think this is something that we have to see from the very beginning. God has kept his promise. If we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 15, verse 12, it says this, As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. 
But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. Isn't it amazing that all the way from Genesis chapter 15, God already knew the plans that he had for his children. He knew what they would face. He knew what they would go through. He knew how they would come out fully possessing what the Egyptians would give them if they just had one thing. And what is that one thing they needed to accomplish all of this? Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 reminds us of this. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come? I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. God knows the end from the beginning. He is God and God alone and He will do as He pleases. Pharaoh, shut your mouth. I am the Lord. So God has laid the footwork He has laid the path. He has spoken it to His people. He has promised it to Abraham. And He is now fulfilling it through the plagues that He will bring upon Egypt. Exodus 20, verse 3, the beginning of the Ten Commandments, says this, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have what? Say that again. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, There's a Bible. As I look at my wife, there's a Bible study. No other gods, right? This is where that Bible study came from. It's interesting because if we look at the very beginning of the Ten Commandments, he says something very important I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am your God. I am the Lord. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery and bondage to the enemy. Therefore, all that I have done for you delivering you from the enemy, from the evil one, from bondage, from sin, from slavery, there should be no other gods before me in your life. That's a whole sermon in itself. In fact, that's a whole Bible study. If you want to go to it, it's after this class, after this sermon. Because of what God has done for each and every one of us, delivered us from the hands and the grips of the enemy, from the pits of hell, from the lake of fire, the perfect Lamb of God, who is our Passover Lamb, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, I believe it is. Jesus Christ is our Passover Lamb. There should be no other gods before him there should be no other gods before him there should be no other gods children before him there should be no other god gold and silver before him there should be no other god career cars planes trains and automobiles before him There should be no one in your life before him, husband, wife, daughter, son, grandchildren. There is only one God who deserves our full and undivided, devoted attention and love. And that is our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, who died in our place 
who allows the death angel to pass over us when we breathe our last because He has stood in the gap petitioning the Father, this is my child, this is my son, this is my daughter. I shed my blood for them. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And they faithfully have put their trust in Me. Father, pass over this one. They are ours. Apart from Me, there is no other God. You shall have no other gods before me. Let that just resonate for the next 35 minutes and then we'll go home. Because that's where we are today. We put everything before the Lord. Don't say we don't, because you're lying. We put everything before the Lord. Because we live in this world, we spend how many hours a day massaging the things of this world? I know we don't spend a lot of time thinking, contemplating, and praying, and receiving what the Lord has for us, because we'd be a changed people. We would treat each other differently. We would live differently. Our attitudes, our actions, our thoughts, the places we go, the things that we do, the people that we pursue would be completely different. And yet we're hung up on so many other things because we put everything as self-centered individuals before the King of Kings. And this is exactly what Pharaoh did his entire life. Everything was before the Lord. He managed to manipulate every God, little g, that was out there for his benefit. And that was one of the fallacies that the world follows. We follow all these little gods, thinking that in in, in worshiping them, somehow they bring life and satisfaction. I I sat down with my boys the other day, and, you know, Elijah's looking for cars, and, you know, Legend's looking for a girlfriend. You know, we got all the things going on. Adele's pursuing a career in college. (laughs) London is, you know, coming out of high school this year. She's, you know, done with basketball and volleyball. The last games are around the corner. No, there's going to be tears and all that kind of stuff. But I really got down. I sat down. I got to thinking about it. So, so what, what, what is basketball? It's a game. It's entertainment. In the grand scheme of life, as I look at all the Kirchhoffs, because they make up an entire basketball team over there, and they played very, you guys played well that game. Um... But what, is it, what does it matter? In the grand scheme of eternity, what does basketball mean to anybody? Zero. Nothing. It doesn't save a soul. It doesn't promote the things of God. What does a car do for us? It doesn't matter what emblem's on the car. It doesn't matter if it's a Chevy, a Ford, a Rolls Royce. Go. It doesn't matter what it is. What does it do? It gets us from A to B. It sits outside most of its life we drive it maybe 15 percent of the time that we own our cars in the end what does a car do for us eternally does absolutely nothing our iphones or any smartphone any, any dumb phone what does it do for us I mean, it's almost an appendage, right? Some of us, we would think it's sewed to our hand because we're always like this. You know that. I mean, you, you guys know these things. We know these things. It drives you crazy that your kids are on their phones all day long. Does it not, parents? Raise your hand. Does it not drive you that crazy that your kids are on their phones? You have no idea what they're looking at from porn to you know, Snapchat to whatever. Maybe they're looking at recipes. I don't know. But there's nothing good that comes through the wave of phones. And when your kids do not let you have their phones to look at, they're looking at something wrong. When they're always anxious, when you grab their phone, they're looking at something wrong. Just let it be known. I mean, we're not stupid. Kids, we're not stupid. We know you're looking at things that you shouldn't be. We know you're saying things, doing things, texting things that you shouldn't be doing. And parents, we know you're doing the same thing, whether it's Facebook, TikTok, pornography, whatever it is, chatting with your secretary. We know you're doing things that are not right, right? Not all of us, but that that happens. We've turned our phone into our God. Otherwise, you'd be able to put it down and not look at it for an hour. Try that. This is what Pharaoh's done. 
This is why the Bible is so relevant for today, because what Pharaoh did back in his day, we do today. We just repeat it, and we have not learned, and we should. We need to begin learning, because time is short. If you have you not seen where the world is today, and read Matthew chapter 23, 24, read all of it. I mean, read the Bible. There's no more time to say, you know what, health, wealth, and prosperity, that everything's going to work out in the end for you, and God's not going to let you get sick, and he's going to give you the perfect spouse and the perfect... All that's a bunch of crud. That's all the false gospel. The true gospel is that we are sinners. And apart from Christ's saving work in our lives, we will go to hell where we will have the full wrath of God expended upon us for all eternity. That is the gospel truth. But Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, who allows the death angel to pass us over if we just put simple faith in Him for the forgiveness of our sins, He will save and redeem us and become our God, our Father, and we will be his people. And right now, kids, you're looking around and you're thinking inside your brains, I got plenty of time to, to think about this. I love what I'm looking at. I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm seeing on the internet. I love the people. I Stop it and wake up. If your parents can't shake you, let the Lord shake you because time is of the essence. You have no idea. Life is but a vapor. You may not live to 80. You may not live another 80 seconds. And then, boom, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Your iPhone's not going to save you. Your friend, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mom, your dad. Jesus Christ is the only one who will save you. And we preach this every day, and yet we walk out of here and we go, la, 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 let's go to McDonald's and have a quarter pounder with cheese. I am the vine, John 15, 5. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That is the promise of God. The ten plagues of Egypt, also just known as the ten plagues, or the biblical plagues, are described all the way from Exodus chapter 7 all the way through Exodus chapter 12. These are ten disasters sent upon Egypt by God to convince Pharaoh of one thing. Actually, of two things. To let my people go. You do not own my people. My people's address and zip code is in a different part of the country. Let my people go. And the second thing that God sent these plagues for was to show Pharaoh that he and he alone is God Almighty. And in showing Pharaoh and all the Egyptians this, the world would know at large that there is one and only one true God, not all of these little gods that Pharaoh follows. This is what God has been trying to show each and every one of us all through Christianity, all through church history. God has been trying to scream the same thing over and over. I alone am the Lord God Almighty. Apart from me, there is no other. And there should be no other gods before me in your life. And we can justify it how we want. You can say, Drew, I don't care what you say. I love my job. I love this. That's fine, but your heart's in the wrong place. We are to look drastically different than the world at large. Drastically different. And I don't care if you're rich or poor. If you're a rich, amen, right? But God says these riches have been given to you to advance my kingdom, not to advance yours, Pharaoh. I don't mind that you're rich. Some of you are probably, I know there's a millionaire sitting in here right now. I know there's a couple millionaires sitting in here right now. I'm looking right at them. And you'd never know that by the way they look. But God gives us those resources and those finances not to make our kingdom larger, but to advance His cause. And He will continue to backfill if you just trust Him and have a little bit of faith. You see, when you amass the wealth, you put your faith in your money. But God says, I've given you this to bless you, to advance my kingdom. Let go of it, and I will open your hand, and I will backfill as much as you need. He's obviously trusted you with much. He can trust you with much more. But Pharaoh was not convinced that God was God. And so he kept the people in bondage. The Israelites, he kept them as slaves, and he oppressed them, 
and they had endured this for over 400 years. And so God sends the most unlikely character, Moses, as the deliverer. And some of you might think that Jesus is not much of a deliverer because he died on a cross, but I tell you what, Jesus and Jesus alone is the one that every man, every woman, every knee will bow before. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It doesn't matter if you think he's as stupid as Mickey Mouse or as funny as Jim Carrey. It doesn't matter if you think he's a lunatic or a liar. He is still the Lord. He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't ask for an opinion or an evaluation of his life. He has validated his life through signs and wonders by his Father through him to show himself all that he needs to show us, that he is truly God. And he was sent to cultures that worshiped many other gods and so jesus understands the 21st century he understands where we are in 2024 he understands everything that we face and yet the bible still rings true pharaoh and the Egypt and the egyptians all believed in many little gods what did they believe in all of these little gods to do? They believed in these little gods and all the natural acts that happened around these little gods as pointing to the fact that these gods were actually alive and were blessing Pharaoh and his land. So the god of the Nile, when the Nile River would flood over its banks due to natural phenomenons called weather patterns and clouds would form and rain would fall and the Nile River would overflow, Pharaoh thought that the god was blessing him and overflowing the banks of the life-giving Nile to the land to produce crops abundantly. So they named a god of the Nile and they worshipped this god. And they had a god for everything. They had a god for, for life. They had a god for for prosperity they had a god of the cattle they had a god of the newborns they had a god of the sun they had a god of the moon they had all kinds of gods that they worshiped and so pharaoh as he proclaimed earlier in the exodus he proclaimed i don't know this god this god that you speak i don't know this god why would i why would i even follow why would i listen i don't know this god and he was right he didn't know the one true god but he knew all these other gods that he worshiped and that he venerated and that he gave time and resources to because he saw the benefit that these gods brought but yet what he failed to realize was that the creator Yahweh was behind everything that was happening in his life and that he should be worshipped, not the created order, but the creator himself should be worshipped because apart from him, Pharaoh, there is no other God. And so God was going to bring these plagues upon this culture that worshipped a, a wide variety of gods and attributed their powers, the natural phenomena they saw in the world around them to these little gods. And God is going to come and do a polemic or he's going to come against these other gods to show that they don't hold water against him and that he is absolutely above all of these gods, Pharaoh. And this is a scary thing to us. God will come into our lives and systematically take out all of the little G's that we follow in our life just to bring us to a point of understanding. Apart from him, there is no other. I alone am God Almighty. I mean, I wish he'd come and take some phones away, don't you? I wish he'd wipe out 401k so that we don't keep looking at the stock market every day, wouldn't you? And I say these things because these things are not just, you know, invading your territory or your camp. They invade our territory as well. People called of the ministry. And God will shake and rattle us even as ministers to say, hey, wake up apart from me. There are no other gods. 
This is why we need the gospel every single day. I had a family leave this church because they heard the gospel too much. Could you imagine that? We don't need the gospel every week, Andrew. Oh, yes, we do. We need to know that we are sinners saved by the grace of God. Otherwise, we become self-assertive, self-sufficient, self-righteous individuals who think that we are all that in a bag of chips. Am I wrong? And you know them, don't you? And so he brings these plagues. The first plague was turning the Nile River to blood. What was going on there? I'm going to read my notes because I want to get all this right. By turning the Nile to blood, what was God doing? He was bringing judgment against the God that they worshipped called Apis. A-P-I-S. This was the God of the Nile. The God of the Nile. And then Isis, the goddess of the Nile. So there was a God and a goddess. Apis and Isis. The goddess and the god of the Nile. And then there was Knum, the guardian of the Nile. So there were three gods watching over the Nile, the life-giving Nile that brought trade and boating and traffic and millions of fish for eating and the water, the pure water that they could drink. These three gods that they worshipped, God brought a plague and He turned the, the river Nile into what? Into blood. Let me see how Apis, Isis, and Canum are doing now. Who rules the Nile? The same God that rules the sands. Yahweh. Learn this, Pharaoh. And what does Pharaoh do? He hears Moses' words every time before these plagues. Let my people go. Thus says the Lord. These are my people. Let them go. He hears the word of the Lord. He ignores it. He sees God's miraculous power. Sometimes he repents, right? Please take away the frogs or the flies, right? And then what happens? Moses prays for him. God takes away the flies. And then what? Oh, Mo, then it says that, that Pharaoh sinned again and will not let the people go. Whenever Pharaoh got a little bit of yielding, whenever Pharaoh saw that things kind of got better, he's like, oh, forget it. Never, I didn't really mean it. Never mind. I was caught. Now I'm not. It's okay. I was in trouble, but now I'm not. It's good. No, that's not how it goes. You don't just go out and sin. He even said, I've sinned again. I've sinned again. If you look at this, he hears the word. He ignores it. He sins against the Lord. Then he finds some relief, and then he goes back to this hardening of his own heart. This is the cycle, as I talked about a few weeks ago, of how we become so hard to the Lord after hearing his word and seeing his miraculous power and continuing to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to him and walking away over time. We become so hard, God says, you get what you want. Have it. That's a dangerous place to be in because it produces death, as we see in the 10th plague. So God is over these gods of the Nile. Then the second plague was bringing the frogs of the Nile, or from the Nile. This was judgment against Heket. A god Heket. This was the frog-headed goddess of birth. I mean, I, I know Jake and I, we worship that god, that frog-headed goddess of birth. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know what that means. A, a frog-headed goddess of birth. All right, but anyway, so moving on. You see how stupid Pharaoh is? I mean, come on, folks. Let us not follow in the footsteps of Pharaoh and think that these things of this world can save us and bring us anything that isn't fleeting. It's all vanity, Solomon says. It's chasing after the wind. Frogs were thought to be sacred and not to be killed, so they venerated them and they, they worshipped them. But now God brings these frogs to invade every part of the homes of the Egyptians, and then the frogs died. What happened? They began to stink horrendously, right? Their stinky, nasty bodies were all heaped up in offensive piles for God to demonstrate that He has overcome this frog headed goddess. Then the third plague was of gnats. This was the judgment on Set, the goddess of the desert. The god of the desert. We have a god of the desert now. So 
this is where the line is kind of drawn in the sand. Unlike the other plagues, the magi magicians could uh, you know, replicate, but now they cannot. So the, the third plague of the gnats, the magician said, this is definitely is the finger of God. And the fourth plague of the flies was a judgment on Yucatec, the fly god. In this plague, God clearly distinguishes between Israel and the Egyptians. What does he do with his people? He's showing himself powerful to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. But now he is showing himself, which the Israelites probably through the 430 years of oppression and bondage have failed to remember that God is a God of power, protection, and his promises. So he sets his people apart and he puts them in the land of Goshen, right? And what happens there? Do they experience the gnats? No, they don't. What is this showing people? That God is a protecting God of His people. If you follow and obey me, I will protect you. When you hear my word, my people, and you obey and you take preparation to live the way that I've asked you to live, I will separate you from the worldlings and I will protect you as my dearly loved children. This is a gracious God. They did not experience any of the plagues of the gnats. Then the fourth plague of the flies, oh, that was the one that I talked about, I'm sorry. Then the fifth plague was the death of the livestock. This was a judgment on the goddess Hathor and the god Apis, who were both depicted as cattle. And again, God protects his children. They do not experience the death of the cattle. And Pharaoh even sends his own people, says, go check it out. I want to make sure. Go check it out. Is this really happening? Check it out. And they do. And they have plenty of cattle over there in Goshen. Because God is a God who protects his people. And then the sixth plague of the boils was a judgment against several gods over health and disease. Sekhmet, Sunu, and Isis. And this time, God gives the magicians the boils and they cannot stand before God or the Pharaoh because they're so in pain with these boils. What does this show us? I think God is trying to show us that not even man can save you. Not even your neighbor can give you the information that you need to escape the judgment of hell. No person living apart from the Lord can give you what you need. I don't care what they tell you, how they schmooze you and try to win you over. They are mere mortals. They cannot protect you. Then before the last three plagues, God is gracious enough to give Pharaoh a warning. And again, the gracious God who's allowing Pharaoh, even during all of this, the opportunity at any moment, right, to, to bow a knee. Well, it says in chapter 9 that God raised him up for this very purpose. Sure he did, but God can do whatever he wants to do to make a point, right? I know it doesn't, that doesn't resonate well in my heart either that God does that, but this is what God can do. God can do anything that He pleases to do. God can use whatever means He needs to use to get people's attentions, to get them out of bondage, to get them delivered into His kingdom. God can do whatever because none of this matters to Him. This world is not what He's living for or what He died for. He is living and He died for the world to come, eternity. So then the seventh plague of hail attacked Nut, the, god, the sky goddess, and Osiris, the crop fertility god, and Set, the storm god. There was no hail like this ever seen before. It was accompanied by fire which ran along the ground, and everything left out in the open was devastated by the hail and the fire. Again, the children of Israel were miraculously protected just happened no god protected his children and their land no one died no cattle died and their crops were beautiful all because they were set apart they listened they prepared they obeyed the lord 
And then before God brings the next few plagues, He tells the Israelites, or He tells Moses to tell the Israelites that they'd be able to tell their children of the things that they had seen God do in Egypt and how it showed them God's power. If you look at Exodus chapter 10, verse 2, it's exactly what He tells them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, I have hardened his heart and the heart of his officials so that I may perform these miraculous signs of mine among them that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them and that you may know that I am the Lord. God is interested in the next generations and he wants us to continue to tell and to raise up children that understand the miraculous things that God has done in our lives. Don't shy away from telling your children what God has done, is doing, and will do in your lives right now because they need to know today before the world's little G's get a hold of them that there is a true God, big G, Jesus Christ who loves them and died for them and can provide for them all that they need because He is the provider, the protector. He is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. They don't need to settle for imitation gods in the form of an apple with a bite taken out of it. I wonder why they chose that one for apple. The eighth plague of the locusts, again focused on Nut, Osiris, and Set. The crops of wheat and rye which had survived the hail are now completely pulverized by the locusts that had come in. The ninth plague was the darkness. This was aimed at the sun god Ra, who was symbolized by Pharaoh himself. He wore the sun banner with the snake. So for three days they had darkness over the land of Egypt. Even the inside the homes, it said in uh, Exodus 20, or 10, verse 23, that there was no light even in their homes. And then the tenth and the last plague, the death of the firstborn males, was the judgment on Isis, the protector of children. In this plague, God was teaching the Israelites a deep spiritual lesson. What was He teaching them? He was teaching them about Christ, was He not? Take this perfect little lamb, one-year-old lamb. Anybody ever have a one-year-old lamb? Are they cute? I don't know. Are they cute? Bad. Are they cute? They're probably really cute. A little one-year-old lamb. I don't imagine they're cute. One-year-old dogs are cute. One-year-old cats are cute. One-year-old guinea pig. Little pigs, piglets, right? Don't people have piglets? Chickens? I mean, we're naturally affectionate towards animals like their life. And I think this is the point that God's trying to make. Care for this lamb. Take the best lamb that you have, perfect, without a blemish, just like my son. Get to know him for a while. I'm going to send my son for a few years to be in tabernacle with each and every one of you that you get to know him and that you get to hear him, that you'd fall in love and be enamored by him. He would be the way, the truth, and the life. Do you get to know this lamb? I want you to look at that lamb every night in the eyes and tell it how much you love it. Cuddle with it. It'll keep you warm at night. It's full of wool. Do that for 14 days. If you do that for 14 days, you've definitely formed a habit of loving this lamb. Then on the 14th day, I want you to slaughter it. This lamb that you love, that you've cared for, that's perfect and blemish-free, that doesn't need to die because it's perfect. Now, you would kill a lame lamb, but this little one that you've cared for 14 days, slaughter it and cook it and eat it and then take its blood and I want you to paint the doorposts and the lentils I want you to paint the top and the sides of your to paint your house door with this blood can you imagine that picture as you stood in front of your children I mean, Kirchhoff's example here. Imagine your dad taking a little one-year-old lamb in the center of your kitchen and you're all gathered around and he slices its neck and blood pours out and you're all weeping and wailing. I mean, that's a great dad, right? Wonderful dad. Thanks for killing our little lamb. I mean, that'd be traumatizing, would it not? 
I mean, that'd be traumatizing to me. <laughs> you would remember that, wouldn't you? That's the point. God understands how forgetful we are and that we need a visual and we need repetition. That's why he tells us to continue to do this. Celebrate the Passover over and over and over and over again. Tell your children, remember this. Put the blood out. This example you'll never forget. I've given you a visual. You've taken part of it through action. And I want you to repeat it every single year. And so they do. They paint the, the doorposts and the lentils with blood. And what happens at night? Just as God promised, the death angel goes through the towns and he passes over. That's why it's called the Passover. He passes over any house that has blood on its doorposts and lentils. The death angel is not permitted of God to go in and wipe out the firstborn. And when this plague is over, there is all through the land weeping and wailing like never heard before. No one was spared. Because God is not a respecter of persons. If you are not in the family and you do not listen and obey what he says, you will meet the death angel. But if you know Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, who was slaughtered and slain, led to the slaughter... <laughs> and His blood was shed for the remission of sins, if you know Jesus Christ, the Passover Lamb today, you will escape the death angel. But you will also look very different than most people. You will be so different that you will attract other people to the kingdom of God. Do you know who came out of Egypt that night? Who came out of Egypt that night? Who? Say it one time. The Is that all that came out? God is not just after His chosen people. God is after anybody who would have simple faith in Him. It took a lot of faith to go ask the Egyptians for silver and gold. It took a lot of faith to plunder the Egyptians on their way out. But they needed faith in God. And they showed their faith in God by asking the Egyptians for gold and silver and following every word that God said. It took faith to slaughter a lamb and put blood on the post, thinking that this is going to keep a death. It took faith. But in their execution of their faith they drew people to themselves that had questions that asked why are you doing this well because the death angel's coming through tonight and if we leave our house and don't have the blood we're going to die well how do you know that because god yahweh told us and he is the one and only true god all these little gods that you've seen our god overpower those gods aren't going to save you only the one true god's going to save you and they listened as God's people shared. And if we look down at Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, we're going to see that not only Israelites came out of the Exodus. If you look at chapter 12, verse 37, the Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Many other people, oh, many other people went up with them, as well as large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds, with the dough they had brought from Egypt. They baked cakes of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Many other people went up with them. Now, it would not have said that if it was just all Israelites. God is after anybody who would listen and allow him to circumcise their heart. Who is watching your life? Where are you putting your faith? In what are you putting your faith? Are you putting your faith in the only one who is powerful, who is a protector, and who has a plan for your life? His name is Jesus. Because if you put your faith in him, he'll radically change your life. 
And he will bring your neighbors along with you as he changes your life. And as they see a change in you, they will ask you, what in the world is different about you? And many other people will go out with them. Folks, I pray that the Lord has spoken to you. And if he has, I pray that you would just respond in your heart. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to respond to your word. Father, it's by simple faith that we are saved. And I pray today, Lord, that those that are far from you, those that are living for themselves today would have heard clearly that nothing can save but you and you alone. Jesus, you are the Savior of the world. And I thank you that it's only by simple faith in you for the forgiveness of our sins that we can even repent of those sins and fully trust in you. Father, thank you for saving those who are crying out to you right now for the forgiveness of their sins. Thank you for your message to each of us. Help us to live a life worthy of our calling. May you be centerpiece, the centerpiece of our lives, as there are no other gods before you. God, may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.